Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In our last few lectures, we've talked about the process of escalation under the Lyndon Johnson administration, particularly following the Gulf of Tonkin incident and resolution. In this lecture, we'll talk about the escalated bombing campaign that came about as a result of that process, Operation Rolling Thunder. On February 13, 1965, Lyndon Johnson authorized Operation Rolling Thunder, a systematic, expansive bombing campaign using both American and South Vietnamese aircraft against North Vietnamese targets. This was a major escalation of the war. Sustained attacks began on February 19, 1965. There were still a large majority of Americans that supported this action. Polls showed that 67% of Americans supported the bombings, and newspapers and editorials supported it, with rare exception. Also in February, the final coup in the South Vietnamese government concluded with the Young Turks in control of the government. They would rule as a junta and would support American intervention. It seemed that perhaps Americans were managing to stabilize the situation in South Vietnam. And yet the bombings also resulted in an increased need for ground troops, which was one of Lyndon Johnson's major campaign promises that he would not commit Americans to a ground war in Asia. General Westmoreland soon requested two battalions of Marines to provide ground security for the growing airfields. Lyndon Johnson sent the ground troops without a great deal of deliberation or planning or the possible consequences that would come. The first ground troops arrived on March 8, 1965 at a beach south of Da Nang. These were the first of more than 2.7 million young men and women who would serve in Vietnam over the next eight years. They were met at that time by pretty Vietnamese girls who placed lays around their necks. Initially, they were sent as protection of the airfields, but quickly they were needed for more extensive operations. With increasing numbers and attacks from North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces, Lyndon Johnson had to confront again the possibility of losing South Vietnam. On March 2, 1965, Operation Rolling Thunder officially began. The objectives of Operation Rolling Thunder were fairly simple. The idea was to break supply lines flowing from north to south, where the North Vietnamese would send troops and supplies along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail, incidentally, suggests a trail wandering through the woods like you and I might encounter while hiking through a national park. And in the early years, it may have resembled that. But by this period, and continuing to grow over the course of the war, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was actually a series of roads and even highways flowing from north to south, at one point reaching as many as 10 highways flowing side by side, over which tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of troops and major weaponry could flow. A related objective of Operation Rolling Thunder was to cut off the stream of troops that seemed to steadily flow from north to south, and indeed increased throughout this period. A final objective was to break the morale of North Vietnam, to demonstrate to them that the constant shelling and bombing, like rolling thunder during the midst of a thunderstorm, would pound them into submission. In fact, rolling thunder proved to be a dismal failure at all of those objectives and more. It failed to bring Hanoi to the bargaining table and to achieve peace. It became clearer and clearer as the operation went on that there was no way to bomb their way to victory in this war. In fact, it failed to stop the supply of men and troops and material and supplies flowing south along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. As I'll demonstrate in future lectures, the growing numbers of troops and the amount of supplies only continued as this process went on. It also failed to dim the morale of the North Vietnamese. 
much like the bombings of London during World War II, served to galvanize the British as Winston Churchill made his glorious speeches during that time. These bombings only served to fortify and strengthen the resolve of those in North Vietnam, and in fact proved to many that they were justified in their fight against the Americans and the South. They also failed to make a noticeable improvement in the morale of those in the South. Many in the South were already questioning what the Americans were doing there, what their purpose was. In fact, many supported Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese during this process, and that only continued. This augmented and underscored the political failures in the South as well, and these bombings did nothing to alleviate the political situation in the South. And finally, and perhaps most significantly, in the short term anyway, these attacks did nothing to help Americans avoid sending ground troops into Vietnam. The initial idea was that we might bomb our way to victory and succeed in this conflict without ever having to send large numbers of ground troops. In fact, just the opposite was true. In order to support the growing numbers of air attacks, Americans were compelled to send more and more ground troops into this growing conflict. Why were these operations not more successful? Well, first, to note, Johnson and his advisors put some restrictions and limitations on the bombings themselves. They really focused on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the supply line running from north to south, which was not particularly easy to hit, even under good circumstances. They restricted bombing, such as areas at the Chinese border to the north, memories of what had happened in Korea, certainly influenced some of those decisions. And in this period, they did not allow the bombing of the large northern cities like Hanoi and Haiphong in order to limit unnecessary civilian casualties. Of course, this also sent the message that this was a limited war and that Americans were not going to do certain things in order to win. As I've mentioned, the bombings themselves were difficult because the targets were hard to hit anyway, but also the weather became a major factor. Monsoon swept in. Many days were rainy, cloudy, and windy. And the terrain was difficult. Trying to spot a relatively small target through jungled terrain was very difficult. The operations were suspended seven different times, including from December 25th to January 31st of 1965 and 66. This was a break essentially for the holidays, but other breaks in the action occurred to offer time for peace negotiations or simply out of frustration that the operation was not more successful. On the whole, as noted, Americans determined they were not going to be able to bomb their way to victory. As much as they might achieve short-term objectives, they might uh, launch some short-term damage, uh, particularly to the Ho Chi Minh Trail, it was not going to be sustained and permanent. And of course, Americans had to bring in more and more ground troops to support these actions. Aside from the breaks that I've noted for a few weeks or a month here and there, Operation Rolling Thunder continued unabated until October 31, 1968. For three and a half years, the Americans launched these sustained bombing runs. By 1968, which we'll talk about much more later in the course, these efforts and the war in general were receiving much criticism back in the United States, and it had been judged to be a failure in terms of achieving its overall objectives. We must also note that over the course of Rolling Thunder, more than 655 American POWs returned by the North. 457 of them were pilots and airmen who were shot down during Rolling Thunder. In our next lecture, we'll assess not only the outcomes of Rolling Thunder and this early period of escalation, but we'll grapple with that all-important question. Why did the Americans decide to step in and take over this conflict at this point in time?